Revelation 3. Revelation 3. We're slowly, slothfully working our way through the book of Revelation. I figure by the time we get done, the Lord will come. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3. This is the church of Sardis. And uh, he mentioned something in here that is somewhat controversial with some people. Um, and I understand the controversy a little bit. I won't spend a lot of time on it. I know some few brothers that would disagree with me. And, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. God, 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 there's no way in the world I could know everything that's in the Bible and, and be right on everything that's in the Bible. It's just not possible that God be true in every man alive. And any pastor or any preacher or any man who sort of brags and tells you that they know it all, they got it all figured out, they're lying. They're not telling the truth. They're that, that glory belongs to God and Jesus alone. And uh, so I've been wrong on things before. I'll be wrong again. And uh, I always encourage you, whatever you may or may not disagree with me on or whatever, uh, go, go back to the Word of God. Prove, prove all things. Don't pass that to you. That's all I would ask you to do. And uh, that will avoid the argument. Revelation chapter 3, let's read down to verse 5, and we'll pick it up at verse 5. The angel of the church in Sardis, write these things, say to you that have the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. You know the seven spirits of God? They are what's in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Uh, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of life, the spirit of understanding. Uh, missing one, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Uh, those are the seven spirits of God. And he has the seven stars. The seven stars, he said, are the angels. There are seven churches. The candlesticks are the seven churches. And he was in the midst of the candlesticks. So he said, where two, two, two or more gathered together in my name, they're in my midst of them. I thought I had that booger on. There we go. Michael's going to have to get a dart gun with one of those suckers that stick like that on my head every time my mic's not on. <clears throat> um, so he says, uh, I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So he is really not happy with this church. And be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. We talked about that. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And I do believe, I do believe upon the scriptures that I've read. That while we do not now know when the coming of the Lord is going to be, I don't, I do not believe it will be a mystery to us. You look at Noah. Noah knew seven days in advance of when the flood was going to begin. God said in Amos, surely the Lord doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. We know that Elijah, the day that he was translated into heaven, he knew it. Elisha knew it. Fifty of the sons of the prophets knew it. Um... And so we know Lot knew when he was going to be taken out of Sodom and so on. And so I just believe that be prior to the Lord taking us home, I believe that we'll know it. I, he will not come to us, he said, as a thief. That's what that's what First Thessalonians 5 says. You're children of the day and not of the night. Therefore, uh, I will not come upon you as a thief. But he says here in verse 3, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. We talked about the, the covering that God has uh, put on his people. 
And that's to cover up our sins, our flesh, our unrighteousness. So we, are, we have put on Christ. We are clothed with Christ. Um, something that I didn't, I don't think I touched on, but if you look at Revelation 12, very quickly, um, women in the Bible are always a type of a church. And here we have a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. The sun is Christ. Uh, Malachi calls him the sun, capital S-U-N of righteousness. Revelation 19 says that the heavens are a tabernacle for the sun. And, uh, and it's talking, which, uh, comes out as a bridegroom. So there that's linking the sun with Christ, the bridegroom. And so anyway, we're clothed upon, uh, with Christ and with his righteousness. Uh, then he says, uh, in verse five, uh, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot his name. Here it is. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Wouldn't you like for your name to be read on that day? We sing a song called when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. That's what that's referring to. There's heaven's roll call. And the names of all of the saints are written in this book of life. Now, I'm not going to get into this. I'm not going to try to sway somebody either way, one way or the other. But he said, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Now, some say that the book of life is the book of every body living, every living person. And if you're a sinner, God blots your name out of the book and you can't go to heaven. I don't necessarily agree with that interpretation and I will show you why. Uh, incidentally, that phrase, book of life, is mentioned eight times in the Bible. Eight's a number for new life and new beginnings. And up on the screen, I have the listing of all the places where the word, the phrase, book of life is found. Out of the eight times, only one occurrence is not in the book of Revelation. So we have uh, Revelation 3, 5. I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In Philippians chapter 4, you can turn there if you want, make a note of this, uh, that it links to Revelation 3, 5, Revelation 13, and so on. In Philippians 4, verse 3, he said, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Now, I like that phrase, yoke fellow. What is a yoke? What's it for? It keeps the oxen and the horses to going in the same direction at the same speed at the same time because one ox may not be enough it requires maybe two think about it out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established when jesus sent the disciples out he sent them out in twos they were yoke fellows they were serving the same master plowing up people's lives so the seed of the word of God could be sown in their lives. They were yoked together. What did Paul say about being unequally yoked? So don't, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Because if you've got an ox, let's say, and a goat, that's an unequal yoke. Doesn't matter where the goat wants to go. Going where the ox is going. Okay? And, you know, we, we were taught, we had some good pastors when we were growing up here. Some good men of God that taught us lessons as young people that, you know, you always look back and say, I wish I'd have listened better. But we had pastors that taught us, 
that passage and said, when you're choosing somebody to marry, choose somebody that believes the way you believe, or you're going to have problems. And that, those guys were right. Because... One is always going to outpull the other if you're unequally yoked. And uh, that applies not just in marriage, that applies in business partnerships. If, you bus if you're in a business partnership with somebody who's lost, and it comes time to pay the taxes, or it comes time to, to, um, to do some kind of business dealing and your business partner wants to do something underhanded and dirty and you don't want anything to do with that, now you find out that there's a problem and now, you, and now that you know about it, you either have to go along with it or you have to confess to it even to your own hurt. Okay? And that's why he tells us, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. But anyway, let's let move on. I got a lot, got a lot to say here this morning. Uh, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Now that verse tells me that the people whose names are in the book of life are yoke fellows with other believers that their name is written in that book because they are born again. It is heaven's roll call book. And, who's, and, and there's a verse coming up here in a little bit. We're going to see it about what happens if your name is not written in the book of life. Revelation 13 verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, and he's talking about the beast here, the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it's the Lamb's book of life. It is the book that the Lamb, Christ, has of those that are in his flock. Okay, they are with him, they are brethren to him, they are saved by him, they are his sheep, his people. And if your name is not written in the book of life, you will worship the beast. Now I say this a lot when I'm doing stuff online. There are a lot of pretend Christians on the internet who speak of conspiracies, conspiracy theories, speak against the new world order, speak against taking our rights away as Americans. They are pretend Christians. And they're all the time saying, this is the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the beast. And I've tried to warn people for years. You can be right about all the conspiracy theories. You can study all the things related to the mark of the beast. You can... Expose the new world order wherever you see it. And yet, if your name is not written in the book of, the book of life, you are going to go get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. Why? Because you are not born again. It is not, it has nothing to do with Studying conspiracy theories and 5G waves frying our brains and chemtrails and all the other stuff that people put on the internet. Brother Sterling, did you understand anything I just said? He doesn't study that stuff. But what I know he does every day is he reads his Bible every day and he believes what it says. He's not going to have a, 
a mark put in his right hand or in his forehead. And I'm, I'm guaranteeing you, and I will say this with my last breath, I'm guaranteeing you that the mark of the beast to those that are lost will be something they will crawl on their knees and beg for. They will. Why? Their name is not written in the book of life. And God is going to separate the sheep from the goats. And the goats are going to be led to the slaughter. They are. Revelation 17, 8. Here, here, it's going to say it almost the same way. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life. Now, here's my question. If the book of life is the book of everybody who lives and it's not just a book of people who were saved or whatever, then how can these people wonder about the beast? How can they get the mark of the beast? How can they do that? They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. And again, this is what I believe. I believe that God already knows Who's on that book and who's is it? Even people that haven't been born yet. I believe God already knows that. Because God knows everything. He's not dumb. He's not waiting for things to happen to figure it out. He knows everything from before the foundation of the world. We are elect according to his foreknowledge. And God has foreknowledge of all, fu of all future events including your salvation. Revelation 20 verse 12. Turn, in fact, turn to Revelation 20. Let's get the gist of Revelation 20, the context. Let's see what comes. Paul said, walk circumspectly. I like, I like to look around a verse to see what comes before and after it, to see what it's being, what's being talked about. What is it mentioning here? And uh, <clears throat> verse 11 I saw a great white throne. We call this the great white throne judgment. I wonder why. The great white throne judgment. I saw a great white throne and on and on and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead <clears throat> small and great stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. Let me explain these books. <clears throat> Who has ever had to stand before? I won't ask you that, but I'll just, I've told this story before. I got a big speeding ticket one time. Couldn't pay it by just going and showing up and saying, I'd like to pay this ticket. They said, you actually have to show up in court for this one. And I went, oh, no. So I put on my best suit. Saved up my money. Took Lisa and the kids. And I'm watching. And, and I realize after a while why, why God has me there. He's going to show me something. And I look and I see the judge. Now, he's the judge. He has been put in that position by God himself. Do you believe that? I do. Now, <clears throat> I didn't ask that judge. Judge, before we even talk about my case, are you born again? Do you believe the Bible? I didn't ask him that. Because whether or not he did or didn't, he's still in authority over me. And I have to yield and, and subject myself to his authority. So I didn't call him Bill or Jack. I called him your honor. So I'm watching other cases before me. And there's a woman there. She's the prosecutor, city of Hillsborough. 
And she pulls out this manila envelope. And inside that envelope is the charges that are against certain people. It has their name in it and their charges. And I went, that's it. When it says the books were opened in verse 12. The books were opened. There is a book with your name on it. That has everything you've done on it. Everything that everybody knows about. Which is a small amount. And then the other 90% of the book, the things that nobody else knows about, but God knows about them. And he had an angel write it down in the book. The things you said, the things you did, the things you did when nobody was around, when you thought nobody was looking. Angels, they're watching and writing it all down. And these are all, and they, there is no statute of limitations. You're going to be charged with them when you stand before God in judgment. And I'm starting to get why God has me here. So when it came my turn, they called my name. I stood up before the judge, very respectful. They read the charges that were against me. I don't remember. I think it was a, I, I honestly did. I honestly thought it was a 55 zone, but it was a 35 zone and I was doing 65. Yeah. And the judge said, how do, how do you plead? And I said, guilty. How can, what, what can I say? What can I, am I going to lie? Am I going to lie to the judge? I could have said not guilty and they could have had a trial. But I said guilty. And he said, is there anything you'd like to say? That day I'd done the funeral of our 13 year old neighbor girl whose dad bought her a four wheeler, but did not buy her a helmet. The helmet would have saved her life. And she went riding on her first ride on the four wheeler and smashed into a tree and died. I had to talk her mom out of committing suicide. It was a very, very sad, sad situation. I had just come from doing that funeral. And so I told the judge that I said, my, my apologies, but I just was not thinking about my driving. So he said, I tell you what, I'm going to give you a one year suspension and sentence. And that means that if you don't speed again, city of Hillsborough for one year, this will go away and it'll be like you've never done it. And I'm just about in tears by this time, George. What sins are you talking about? Because he wiped them away. That judge expunged that record. Because I guarantee you I did not drive 65 in a 35 in Hillsboro ever again. Still don't do it. And um, I had to pay an earthly price for it. Because a lot of times there is. I had to pay court costs. So I had money left in my pocket. I took my family to Dairy Queen and we celebrated with ice cream. All right. But I'm telling you, watch this. The, the book of life, the books of the charges that are against everybody are read off. And those people are going to be judged on the basis of those things that they had done. Let's read it. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Um... And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell were delivered up, the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What does that tell you about the book of life? It's not the book of everybody that's living. It's the book of... Everybody that belongs to Jesus Christ. Everybody. Okay. Um, who can I get? There's a David. We have a child running loose. He just poked his head. Looks like one of mine. 
Check down those steps. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes they escape. Okay. I should have said leave your sidearm at the pew there. But anyway. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. And I, I'm just, I'm telling you. Your church membership does not matter. What you believe about what's going on in this world, who you voted for in the election does not matter. It is, is your name written in the book of life? And when you, and when the, when the Facebook police, and I'm, t I'm not talking about Facebook themselves. I'm talking about some of the idiots that are on Facebook that are just waiting for you to post something that they don't like and they're gonna, and they're gonna jump you for it. When those kind of people jump all over you for your alleged sins that you committed, that they caught you on, you remember one thing, that we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, the people whose names are not written in the book of life are judged by their works. We're not. No matter if those works are good works or those works are bad works, we're not going to be judged by those. We are going to be judged by our faith. Do you trust Jesus? Are you trusting for your salvation and him alone for your salvation? That's what you're going to be judged on. I, and I cannot convince people of that. I, I, when I first started doing the Watchman broadcast, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face. I saw God blessing it. I was enjoying it. I, w it, I was having more fun than humans should be allowed. And the more that I run into the judgmental antichrist Christians, and I'll call them that, the more I run into those people, they suck the joy right out of me. Because I try everything from Scripture to convince them of how people really are saved by grace and that God knows how ignorant and how childish we really are. and We don't understand everything that's in the Bible. But they still want to judge me. They want to judge you. They want to judge everybody. I've had people write comments and say, those poor people at Bethel, none of those people can be saved because of Mike Hoggard. You're not saved because of Mike Hoggard. You're not saved because of Mike Hoggard. So it, it, sometimes if you ask me why, I've sent you several messages on Facebook and written you several emails, and how come you never respond? Sometimes I just can't handle reading them. I'm being dead honest. I can't handle, um, I don't even want to get into it, but they just, there's no joy there. There's all judgmentalism. There's all condemnation. There's nothing but that. And I'd rather, I'd rather let you, I'd rather you know that if you're in Christ Jesus, there is now therefore no condemnation. Amen. Revelation 21, 27. There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those are the ones who are admitted as citizens in the new Jerusalem. See, this is, I want you to think about this. If you're going to enter into a country, would you rather do it legally or illegally? Legally. And that's what the Lamb's Book of Life is. It is the role of citizenship of who has the right to live in heavenly Jerusalem. According to the laws that are already on the books, not new laws that we want to write, but laws that are already on the books. If you come into this country 
illegally, you should not be given a driver's license and a voter's card and welfare money. Is that being mean? No. I had these things because I was born here. I was born here. You can't go to, you can't sneak into Mexico and live off the Mexican government. They'll kick you out. So I don't understand why everybody thinks it has to be the other way when they come in here. I'm all for people coming in here. My son-in-law came in here. He did everything the right way to become a United States citizen. And I was there when they gave it to him. I was never so more proud of him. Anyway, Revelation 22, 19. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Watch this. God shall take away his part out of the book of life. So. 1 John 5, 7. Gone out of the NIV, New American Standard, the Holman Christian Standard, the New English Version, 1 John 5, 7, that verse is gone. Acts 8, 37, gone. Um, Where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, that verse is gone. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting, that verse is gone. So whoever took all of those verses out of the Bibles that are being printed now, the modern translations, what does that tell you? God took their name out of the book of life. It's a serious issue, people. God should take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Serious issue. Now, um, turn your Bible to Exodus 32. I'm not going to have time to get into the neat stuff, but Exodus 32. I want you to look at what kind of man Moses was. If If somebody came, uh, Brother George, you and your wife were out and you're walking to your car and somebody came at you with a gun, I, I can imagine you grabbing Diane and putting her behind you. Okay? Because you're going to shield her. You're willing to give your life for the sake of your wife. Now, look at what Moses was willing to do. It came to pass on the morrow. This is when the Israelites had broke all the commandments and Moses had to cast them down to the ground. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, You have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray, out out of thy book which thou hast written. Now, Brother George is willing to lose his life here to protect his wife, but he knows he's going to heaven. Moses is willing to go to hell so the Israelites wouldn't have to. Moses is a foreshadowing, a prophecy in itself of Jesus Christ who bore all of our transgressions on the cross and said, I am willing so that they might live. D-Day. Other great battles where men jumped to the front of the line and said, I am willing to lay down my life so that others can go free. 
And they did. That's a big thing to do. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And for Moses to be willing to be cast into hell so that Israel could live. That's a leader. That is a leader. And Israel ended up despising him how many times, even after that? Rebelling against him. Let's pray. Father, bless your word today. Give us wisdom, Father, on this book of life. Thank you, Father, that our names are written in it. Father, if there be someone out there, Lord, who's listening to me today, and Father, they just, their mind has been twisted and turned by so much that's out there on the internet, out there in books, out there in so-called Christian TV shows, radio stations. Father, their head has been turned about every other way. Father, I pray to your God, Lord, that they would settle on this one book and yield their mind over to it. Learn from it and understand, God, just what it takes to be saved. It is trusting in you and what you said. Bless your word, Father. And I pray that everybody, Lord, who hears my voice today. God, I can't, I can't bear the thought of people dying and going to hell. So, Father, Lord, would you bless them. And help them, Lord, so that their names are written in the book of life. Thank you, Lord, for this book we pray in Jesus' name. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen.